Okay, I've started the recording. This is Cheryl Dowd again uh, with the WCET State Authorization Network. Wanted to welcome you all to the December Open Forum. This is the last session of our series of award winners for the Sensational Awards. Uh, you recall that uh, our Open Forum is available the second Tuesday of each month at this time. It's a, typically a 30-minute um, Q&A kind of situation where we bring in an expert of the month and you're uh, offered the opportunity to ask questions, your compliance or structure questions of whoever is our expert of the month. However, this fall, we decided to do something a little different. Uh, we used each open forum for the four different sensational award winners. And uh, last but certainly not least are our friends at the University of Kentucky who have won not one, but two awards this year. And uh, they're gonna be able to tell us about their awards and what the project was that earned them the sensational awards. We will go for one hour. We typically are a 30 minute session on the second Tuesday of each month, but we're going an hour today. Uh, so that our presenters have enough time to explain about both awards. I think both are um, of a particular importance and uh, certainly good models to glean uh, some different types of processes that you might want to consider um, modifying and applying at your own institution because this is such good work, just like the other uh, SAN awards and presentations that we've been um, sharing. I want to point out to you that you can find the uh, center square of our topic areas on our homepage uh, for SAN is the Sensational Awards landing page. From there, you can see the Sensational Award winners in years past, plus gain access to the press releases and the presentations of the award winners from the last couple of years. We didn't, we weren't able to record them several years ago, but certainly the last couple of years, we have those presentations for you to review. So you can gain access to all of the open forum from this fall um, from a link that you'll find right there on on the um, Sensational landing page. So without further ado, I would like to turn this over to our friends from the University of Kentucky. We have with us today, Emily Woods, Christina Walker, and Miranda Hines. Um, I'm not sure who's gonna start first, but I will just turn it over to them. Um, and I will stop sharing this lovely photo. As you see, I was able to meander down to Lexington on a very pretty day, you can see the blue sky there, and take some photos um, out in front of their library. It was a very, very nice opportunity to be able to congratulate them face to face and hand them awards. So I'm gonna turn it over to them to uh, share a little bit. They're gonna do one award, um, answer some questions and then move on to the other, but I'll let um, them explain more thoroughly. So I'm gonna stop sharing and hand this over to them. Who wants to start? Great, I think Christina's gonna share her screen here. Great. All right, well, um, first of all, this is Emily Woods, um, and I am with my wonderful colleague, Christina Walker. Um, and so both of us will be presenting uh, about both awards today. And first of all, we want to just um, uh, thank San and uh, thank everyone uh, at the University of Kentucky who has helped us create these, uh, these dashboards and these products. Um, and it really has been a collaborative effort and, and a fun journey. So, uh, Christina, if you would go to the next slide. All right, um, so just to kind of introduce the University of Kentucky um, and its structure. So we have this last fall about 31,000 students um, we actually did go up this year in enrollment, even despite COVID. Um, we have 16 different colleges, uh, including, uh, in addition, the Honors College and the Graduate School. And these colleges range everywhere from arts and sciences to education to uh, nursing. We also have a very robust medical school and a health science college. So a really wide range of different areas. Um, public land grant university. Um, and uh, in terms of structure, it's very decentralized. 
So every college is responsible uh, for most of its own operations, its budget, its uh, decision decision making. And I say that in order to give a little bit of context for what we were working with, because um, we are on what would be central campus. And so it uh, was really gonna be uh, interesting to work with each of these colleges that are usually used to working uh, with some autonomy. All right, I think we're ready for the next one. All right, so then we have our, our compliance unit and we are housed in the Teaching Learning Academic Innovation Unit, um, which was became a merger. Um, we actually were originally in the Information Technology Office uh, when I first joined up in 2017. And we moved over along with UK Online um, and the Center for Enhancement of Learning and Teaching, so a uh, faculty development unit. Um, so we all merged together into one unit. And that was actually really good for us, um, partly because we reported directly to the provost. Um, and we were also um, able to be kind of in the academic world where decisions about academia were made, um, which was gonna be very helpful for us in terms of getting direct connections with our academic programs. So we do compliance for about 200 plus programs. Now those vary in terms of their needs. Um, some programs are licensure um, and they have a lot of out-of-state activity um, and need a lot more compliance oversight. While some other programs, uh, maybe only a, one course has out-of-state activities. Um, but overall, that's kind of what we're monitoring on an annual basis, and these programs hear from us regularly. Uh, we started out, when I first came, in 2017, we had 36 programs, that, and a very few of them actually licensure programs. But with the new federal regulations, uh, bringing in that face-to-face -face component, we quickly went up to about 80 licensure programs. Um, across the university. So uh, it was definitely a huge shift for us um, and just trying to figure out how we're gonna handle 80 licensure programs with all the complexity and the research that that was gonna take. Um, so in terms of our structure, uh, we're, we're very centralized. So we actually coordinate with state authorization liaisons for different programs and each one of them is in charge of their own program and then we coordinate with them but we do most of the research um, we gather information from the programs we depend on the programs to communicate the information that we research and that we find out but we do most of that research uh, between christina and myself great well, thank you so much for that introduction, Emily, and um, also Cheryl. And thank you providing for providing, excuse me, that insightful information. And just good afternoon to everyone before I get into the field placements. Um, again, my name is Christina Walker. I do use she, her, and hers pronouns. Now, of course, you all work in this field, so you know uh, your field placements are going to be your activities like your clinicals, your student teaching, practicums, and so on. And those generally, of course, with certain limitations, do fall under SARA. Um, yet, for our professional licensure programs specifically, they will fall under the jurisdiction and purview of other state professional licensing boards as well. So while Sarah, on the other hand, still requires oversight and in including the reporting of these activities. So with that being said, it was very important for us to develop an efficient process to ensure that all of our programs were legally operating out of state. And of course, with this oversight being a part of the state authorization process in general. So this involved a very in-depth process uh, with various elements and collaborations with multiple personnel and entities. And we also experienced, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of challenges along the way. 
Uh, so first things first, we had to overcome a lot of obstacles associated with outdated technology. Um, and the university itself, right, it doesn't have outdated technology or processes in general. But in terms of what our unit uh, was dealing with, we were not privy to those technological advances that our, the rest of our university had. So we were essentially starting doing everything manual. So that meant we were spending hours and hours going to like, research every program website, every certificate, every applicable course website to see, hey, like, is there a certain activity that probably would trigger this that we would need to look at for compliance purposes? Um, and also not just programs that were engaged in those activities at the moment, but that just have the option, right? So for a long time, we had to work through that manual process. And as you can imagine, it was really daunting. It was a really demanding task because of the large amount of our programs. So after we located those applicable programs, we coordinated meetings to seek clarification about those activities. And of course, we would present uh, relevant questions. For example, as you know, like, okay, where are your activities occurring? What do they consist of? Um, is there faculty that's out of state with your students? Are you having an extra office or a mailing address? All of those different things that you all are aware of. Um, but most importantly, as a follow-up, we started to create an annual survey to collect information and data regarding those out-of-state activities. Um, and we'll go into that, showing that specifically to you a little bit later. Now, next, we conducted legal and regulatory research per each state to, of course, determine was our program authorized in the state, right? Did any exemptions apply? Did any requirements apply? Um, once we got that information, we reported that back to our programs and we said, okay, you are fine. You have students in these states or you plan to do these activities in these states. These states are fine. But if we found like a red flag, a student was going to be in a state where they were not authorized or where there were other requirements that needed to be met, we would say, okay, can you show us, you know, that you have gathered some exception to allow this to happen or that you have met these requirements or whatever the case was. Um, and of course, we gathered written documentation for that, not just going by their word. And then after evaluating those processes um, and we just realized that there's a lot of new programs and relevant changes that are coming about all the time. And there's no way that we can continually do this manually like we need to have some type of further support and resources. And so that's when we decided to advocate and engage in education. And that was basically creating buy-in from all of our key stakeholders. Um, we were going to uh, present at different departmental meetings and we were doing compliance sessions. We were cor corresponding with IT units and accreditation units, our legal counselor advisors, um, things of that nature, just to let them know, hey, this is important. This is significant. Um, we do need to operate by these requirements in order to uh, be in legal compliance and regulatory compliance. Now, in terms of the actual physical deliverables that resulted from that. Um, as a result of that collaboration, we now have a much more streamlined process annually. And finally, we have developed a website that enables uh, this information, or I guess the correct term for it is a dashboard, um, to be visible to programs and the public as well, which we'll get into more details about those specifics. But I will let Emily give you a more um, detailed view of what our annual process looks like now. Thanks, Christina. Um, so yeah, just like Christina said, um, you know, there was a lot of development in getting to this process. Um, and so, you know, the, the first part is identifying programs with out-of-state activities. Um, and that you know, goes everywhere. Again, as Christina said, to checking websites, to talking to programs, uh, reaching out to the deans and administrators of colleges to see what they knew, um, and then to be able to reach out to those programs and uh, identify a state authorization liaison that we would work with. Um, and kind of that next step 
and Christina will show you the survey in more detail, but a survey is emailed to programs each fall uh, to collect the information um, about what activities they have in which states. Um, and that survey is then sent back to us and we gather all that data from the, the different programs. And then for each program, you know, the, the, really, the really big step, I'll say kind of the meat of the process um, is the legal research. Um, so both Christina and I do that. We have split colleges between the two of us. Um, and we use um, Lexis Advance and other uh, legal software and uh, sometimes what's on the uh, state agency websites um, to just see what, what, are, what are the requirements are there um, things that need to be done before activities can take place in that state. Um, and oh, Kimberly, uh, Lexis, Lexis Advance. Um, and I will answer, we will answer all the questions um, there at the end. Um, and then kind of step four. Uh, so once we, once we have gathered all that information, we gather it into a report. Um, and we send that report to the program. And, you know, we don't just send it to them, but we, we discuss it with them, ask them if they have any questions. Oftentimes the programs, you know, they'll have a concern about something or um, they just need to discuss something with us further. And, you know, so we'll get to the place where that report um, reflects, you know, both of our, both our findings um, and addresses any of the program's concerns. And so each program receives a report. We also take that information and we update it into our, our compliance database. And if it's uh, relevant to students and what they need to know uh, before enrolling in the program, we'll put it on the state authorization dashboard, which we will actually show you later in our presentation. So that's kind of, and this process is going to be repeated every year. So right now it's, uh, November, December, so we are in step three of the annual process. We have been uh, buried in the legal research, just reviewing everything we learned last year. All right, and so now getting to the products or the actual deliverables that resulted from our development. First of all, uh, we're going to show you the data collection, one of the data collection surveys. And please keep in mind that, uh, so as Emily said, our colleges are split. And so we work closely with our colleges. And so we know our colleges and program inside out individually, but I don't necessarily know what's the best approach for Emily's college and her contacts versus um, vice versa um, with mine as well. Um, so for this, this is a survey that I've created for my particular colleges. Um, not all of them, but the ones that um, are receiving this survey. And so it would say, hey, you're receiving this survey because you are a licensure program and you have out-of-state activities. Generally, these things apply. And I have listed out the colleges here because I already know the colleges that I'm referencing, right? And so they click on their college, they click on the applicable program or list any other applicable programs or courses that would apply. And then they also um, discuss or click on the activity, right? And all of these goes back to those SARA triggers, right? What are you doing out of state that would trigger a physical presence? Another thing that is new this year is virtual clinicals and practicums. We're tracking those. And the reason why is because we've noticed that specifically with professional licensure programs, some states are considering it a physical presence if you have like a student that is not in another state, but that's still virtually interacting with a supervisor or preceptor in another state. Um, and so they're saying, well, yeah, we know it's COVID. We know that you're doing this as a modification, but your student still needs to get an internship license or permit or whatever the case may be. And that's not in all cases, but we have found that in some of our professional licensure programs. So we want to track that information to make sure there's nothing additional that's needed. And then of course they would click on that location. We also have internationally, and then they would list out how many students are in each location. 
they would specify where internationally um, if they're in an international location. Um, and we'll kind of go over that a little bit later. Um, and then another thing that I've included on here um, that we also talk to our programs about consistently is right, have you already worked with our legal department or do you have a consortium agreement? Because if sometimes we have red flags and we're in a panic and then later we find out that's all cyclical conversation because it all goes back to, well, we weren't authorized, but we have this legal agreement that allows us to be authorized. And we're like, oh, okay. Well, those two hours of work didn't really make any sense because you were already authorized, even though you typically wouldn't be, right? So we want to ask those questions so we can get that out the way. Um, also, a lot of times if we have a post licensure program and a student is already licensed in the field that they're doing a clinical in and they're employed and they're doing their clinical, of course, at their site, then if we know that that's good, because even if typically students wouldn't be allowed to do that um, particular activity, that may not be the case in this situation. Um, we also talk about international locations and then we just put that basic information there. So that is an example of one of the surveys that we send out. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to communicate to the programs in more simplistic language and then take that information and then transfer that over to what Sarah is requiring us to report because that can get, you know, it has a lot of jargon and things like that um, in terms of data collection and reporting that sometimes we have found programs when we just send it as is, it's a little bit confusing for them. So we need to be able to try to streamline that for them as much as possible. All right, so now going into our actual dashboard, right? This is our state authorization database. And essentially, of course, we know that is pertaining to, can we actually offer the program in another state? But then in addition to that, right, those student field placements. And this is kind of twofold. So first of all, this is public facing what public and students see and they can see their program and they can see whether they're authorized or not to take that program online or hybrid, for example. But then also, and let me pull up a good example here. I'm going to go to nursing, the R um, and to BSN. And it does take a little while to load because of the fact that it um, has a lot of information. Okay, and so we see here in situations where there's clinical experiences, like nursing here, it says limited authorization. And it says clinical experiences are essentially required to graduate, but there's certain requirements for clinicals in Alabama. And as a result, we're not conducting clinicals here. But it gives the student the option that, hey, if you want to take your classes online, right, and you're close enough to commute to an authorized state, you can coordinate to try to do that. And so that's why it's limited. We're not saying we're totally not authorized, but the student has to make that decision, obviously, right? And we would have to coordinate that to make sure that everything is good to go. Um, but the other aspect of this dashboard is that faculty, when they go down here and log in, they can actually see those stipulations for those clinicals. So if we see something that says not authorized or limited authorization, when they log in, they'll be able to see more. We want it to condense it for the public, but they will be able to see more in terms of those details for the clinical. So if they ever forget, hey, why can't we offer these clinicals here? Or what do we need to do to do this? They can go ahead and see that. And I'm gonna actually go back to the PowerPoint and let Emily continue from there. I'll put this back in full screen. Sorry, as you see, I have messages popping up, so it's throwing off my uh, scroll here. Okay. And now, please, we have questions. And I'll stop sharing, Emily, so you can go ahead and take over for that. Well, let's see, that was wonderful. I appreciate this very thorough explanation. It's a fabulous product that you, and I hesitate to even call it a product, this, this project, this enormous project that you put together um, for uh, the benefit of the students. 
And uh, so what I'm seeing here are a couple of questions. Um, I just want to remind everybody that this is being recorded. And just like the other Sensational Award uh, projects uh, from Open Forum, they are available on the SAN website. Um, so there's a question here. Um, for the forms completed in November, do programs complete the form in November for the fall, summer, and spring terms? How is that structured? So basically what we do is we do it for the whole academic year. Like, so right now we're doing it for 2020 through 21. So what, where are your students right now or where are your activities right now? And then where are they anticipated to be upcoming in spring of 2021? And then once we do it for 21, 22, we'll be able to cover that as well. Um, uh, are you in a position uh, for one of our colleagues to be in communication with you all about the contents of the survey used? Yes, absolutely. Great. Um, another colleague asks us about the database. Who built it and what is the platform? Uh, does it connect to your student information system? Yeah, so um, I will actually be getting more into the, I'll call it the techie detail of that database in the next one because it's very much connected with our licensure project. Um, and I'm always here to answer more questions about that. Great. Um, is there a way to share a template of the data sheet that feeds the database? Yes, uh, it will depend on um, what visualization software your institution uses. So for us, we use Tableau. Um, but the data sheet, and I'll show you it, it's just a pretty simple S uh, SQL database. Okay. Um, I think that is the end of our questions for now. I know there will be more questions as we move forward and review your other wonderful projects. So uh, let, let's, let's move on to your next project. Perfect. All right, so, yep, so our our next one was our, our fun licensure program and disclosure project. Um, so uh, as so many other institutions uh, are also working on this, uh, this project started uh, when we received the new federal regulations that require licensure information to be disclosed to students uh, for both online and face-to-face -face programs. Uh, so we realized this was gonna be a very complex project um, and really needed to tackle three areas. So that first one was just a simple educational campaign. Uh, I say simple, it, it's not quite simple. Um, so, you know, figuring out what are key stakeholders uh, were on campus, what units were going to be involved, um, and just educating starting from the top. So we met with the provost, we met with the deans and the associate deans, uh, telling them this is what is required, this is what's uh, going to be needed. And then um, going to each college and each program um, and it kind of, uh, it was kind of a two way street. Not only were we educating the colleges and programs about what was gonna be required, but we were also learning at the same time which programs were gonna be considered licensure programs, um, you know, what uh, information such as accreditation, crediting bodies, certification exams, all of that information that is connected with licensure, we were gonna need to learn everything about that program. And both Christina and I can tell you, it, it almost requires you being an expert of that field uh, very quickly. So we needed to work closely with the colleges and programs. Um, that second piece was like, how are we gonna do the licensure research? Um, obviously a lot of information was going to need to be learned very quickly. Um, so not only getting the pertinent program information, um, but also how are we going to research the state regulations, uh, making sure we were getting the most current regulations, um, being able to monitor whether they were changed or not. Um, so how we managed that, uh, we bought 
uh, Lexus Advanced Software for both Christina and myself. Um, it is very expensive software, um, so but for us it was worth it because we had 80 licensure programs and we just we needed a system that was going to be able to help us get that information quickly and also be able to monitor if state regulations change. So that software was really worth um, the investment for us. Um, and then just communicating with state boards. So we spent really it was it was about a year of licensure research uh, for us um, and you know so okay then we have a ton of licensure research so we have all of this information uh, that christina and i have on different pdfs and spreadsheets but how are we going to get that to the public and that's where that third piece came from how are we going to develop um, a system that students could access that faculty could access um, easily that could be updated as regulations changed um, and we wanted something that was not only accessible but also easy to use um, and easy to use for the public and a prospective student who may not even be familiar with licensure um, so part of that was reaching out with our information technology team we actually have a tableau a few tableau experts on our campus um, which is a visualization software. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, and then we needed a database creator. So we worked with our information technology team uh, to develop a dashboard. Uh, I was telling Cheryl earlier, I actually needed a whiteboard all the time to just visualize and draw out what was going to be needed, what needed to be shown, um, you know, when students or any kind of user came. Um, you know, they, they needed to know too what we needed. Um, so it really was a regular fun, I will say fun collaboration with our information technology team. So those three areas were just the big areas that we were gonna really need uh, to, to, to tackle in order to get this project done. And I will let Christina explain uh, our process a little bit further. If I can, there we go. All right, awesome. So as all of you can relate, in the earlier stages of our licensure process, we spent a significant amount of time determining what was compliant, right? What did that actually mean? What did a compliant process entail in accordance with Sarah, with the HEA regulations and also the recent amendments. So another thing we considered was what was compliance in accordance with what our institution deemed to be compliant. So for instance, deciding when we would implement the new regulations, the approaches that we would take based upon guidance from our legal counsel, and then also um, what did individual student disclosures actually entail. So all of those things. And once we understood that, we moved on to information gathering and research, which Emily already explained in detail, and also our educational uh, campaign, which Emily has already explained as well. So in the end, our work resulted in specific physical deliverables to help us essentially streamline this process. And the most prominent one, of course, um, is the licensure database. However, in order to uh, get a better context, um, there are also uh, other deliverables that act in concert with that database in order for us to have an overall streamlined process. And um, first of all, we have electronic notifications. And essentially, whenever a licensing program begins or when they make changes that could have licensure implications, um, for example, like your accreditation or curriculum changes, we are now able to receive automatic notifications so that we have that information at our fingertips, excuse me, and we can conduct any additional research or follow ups if we deem that's necessary. And then also for our online licensure programs, beginning for the very first time, we are now referenced in that application process. So that allows them to be aware that they will need to go uh, through a, a compliance process when they first start. 
And obviously, as you can imagine, that makes it much easier, right? Because it allows them to understand like, hey, I'm setting up this new program. I need to do A, B, and C. I need to meet with this department and that department. Also, there's a compliance process too. Okay, they're aware of that, um, which is a very uh, different change from what we experienced in the beginning, um, which of course sometimes put us in a precarious situation because we had to create that buy-in after the fact and try to get them to understand the significance in that process and the legal implications. And so it's much easier when it's like, okay, from the beginning, this is what the process entails. And then next we have uh, consolidated disclosure reports. So after checking for any updates and amendments to any pertinent laws and regulations, basically we send out a consolidated report and yeah, Emily has it here. And basically what we say is, hey, you're a licensure program. These are all the laws that apply. You have to say this verbatim pursuant to these regulations. This document, right, summarizes the disclosures that are published by our office. You can click on that link to go into details and see those, how students see those. Um, but also here is a summary in this document. And so moving to page two, we just list out kind of the states and then we say it meets, it doesn't meet, cannot be deter determined, excuse me. Continuing to go down to the next page. We also put in there our licensure disclosure that we send for the individual disclosures to students. So programs understand, okay, what is coming out of um, the office, right? And then um, next, here we also, if a program has out-of-state field education, we'll put this in there too. We'll consolidate that and put that in there as well. Explain the importance of that and the governing laws and regulations that apply for that. Um, next, we also have summary, whether the uh, field education is authorized, when and where, and all of those different um, details. Again, they can go into the database to see those specifics. And then the most important here is that I want to bring attention to is we have an acknowledgement page. And essentially this here, we really stress to our, our programs that we want to collaborate with you. We want this to be a collaborative, collaborative process, um, right? But legally there are things that we are required to put out. Um, so what this does is we want you to know like, okay, we are working with you, please sign this and acknowledge that we went over this and that you understand what the compliance process entails and all of these different things, licensure, disclosure, author status um, for just for the program's knowledge and for our record keeping as well, actually discuss this with the program. But then we also state um, for some reason, if you don't sign, because sometimes we've had um, not very many, but rarely, sometimes you may have a program or two that for whatever reason, they don't wanna comply um, or they make it a little bit more difficult. We just let them know, I just wanna give you a heads up. I'm sorry, I don't have discretion in this, but even if you don't wanna sign or don't wanna work with us, we have to put this out there. And so that, that helps a lot. All right, and I think that's it for that. Perfect, thank you. All right, I think we're back to the PowerPoint. I'm switching shares. All right, so um, the actual product. So I am actually going to switch over to our our data our database and our dashboard. All right, so this is kind of the behind the scenes database uh, that our compliance team works with. So most of the time it's Christina and I working in this. And this information that is in here feeds into the Tableau uh, dashboards that you see on our website. Um, but this, it looks fancy, um, but for uh, people who work in IT, this is a pretty simple SQL database. Um, we just have a row for each program. Uh, this specialization short connects it with all of our UK data um, that is 
in our institution, our uh, student information system and our program information system, uh, this allows uh, this database to connect to that database. Um, and then we can edit on a regular basis. So, you know, let's say there were some regulations changed in California that would impact accounting. I could go in today, make that change, and it would be updated immediately onto our website. So that's one of the biggest benefits is just the up-to-date change that um, the system allows us to do. So this is just kind of the behind the scenes of of our of our dashboard and um, I will say that if your tech team would like to meet with ours I just um, he has actually allowed me uh, to say if your tech team wants to meet with our tech team just please reach out to us and we can make that connection okay so uh, our website uh, is here and it contains all of our dashboard. So Christina earlier showed you the state authorization dashboard. Um, and this is our licensure disclosure dashboard. So all of that information that we have gathered um, is in that database and is being portrayed through Tableau onto our website. So this is kind of our general disclosure statement um, that there are changes and regulations on a regular basis. We also always put a relocation uh, disclosure they're saying if they change to another state they need to check the the requirements for that state um, so this is the actual actual product and um, so I can I'm just going to show a couple of examples so I can go to architecture and select a program sometimes when you have this much information tableau will be a little bit slow but it, it's not terrible. All right, so I picked architecture in Alaska and it has the program information. It has the state licensure board information. I can click here and it will actually take me straight to the website. We have the program contact information. So that is our state authorization liaison for that program. And then we actually have the disclosure. So generally for our disclosures, we meet the federal requirements to say it meets, does not meet, or cannot determine. Um, we may put a little bit of context in there saying there may be additional requirements such as examinations. If there's um, some kind of post-graduation experience, we typically include that in there as well. Um, just so students have a, a better idea and can make a better decision about whether or not to enroll in the program. Um, all right, I'm gonna give a second example of one that does not meet. So uh, superintendent, our superintendent program in the state of Texas. All right, so here's an example. Again, same program information, but this disclosure is showing um, that it does not meet the educational requirements for licensure in Texas. So again, really simple. We wanted something that was simple for students to use. Typically, they know what program they want to go into. They know what state they're going to be in. Um, and so being able to select those two items gives them the information that they need. All right. And we uh, did want to show um, one more dashboard um, that we've been working on um, just because we want to show it. Um, but it's our international distance learning dashboard. And we've gotten so many questions about it. Um, and it really is connected with all this huge project and we really just expanded it because of the immediate need for international distance learning information. Um, so these are just our general uh, disclosures, considerations um, when offering a program in another country. Um, we do, um, you can see this bold information. This is not for our education abroad experiences. This is for students who are international students in their country wanting to take a distance learning course from UK. And with COVID-19, we just had a um, large number of students this year who they wanted to do that. And so we definitely had a lot of research that we needed to do. Um, we talked to our general counsel and our general counsel um, 
Really, and I think we always encourage institutions to talk to their own general counsel because each general counsel has their own approach. Um, but uh, for us, we we kind of looked and, you know, was there anything that would prohibit, in, in writing that would prohibit us from being able to offer distance learning, yes or no? Um, and that's kind of what we were looking for. Um, so you can see all of these countries um, and, you know, for example, Albania, we have the agency, the agency link um, that students can go to. We have the status, limited authorization. There may be something additional that needs to be done in order for us to provide that program. Uh, there may be limitations. Um, if it's authorized, that means we found in writing um, a regulation that allows us to offer distance learning. If it's permitted, um, that means we have, we, there's nothing in writing that country doesn't actually have a regulation of restricting distance learning, um, but we're going to go on ahead and offer it um, based on the advice of our legal counsel. And then there were several countries that uh, were not authorized. So anyway, we've gotten a lot of questions about this, so we definitely wanted to make sure we, we showed it. Um, as we were looking at our different dashboards. And this is all connected with that collaboration we had with the information technology team. Um, and it's just really great to work with them. And um, yeah, I'm actually gonna stay on this particular, uh, these different pages while people ask questions, because they'll probably ask questions about this. And yeah. So now it's now it's questions. Wow, that's wonderful, Emily um, and Christina. Thank you very much um, for walking us through your project there. That there's so much really great information there. Uh, people are starting to put questions in. If you don't mind, I'll just share the questions with you. Um, the first was uh, regarding the autom automation of your notifications. Um, so you have automation notifications from the program. Uh, what triggers that notification? So it's actually through our institutional effectiveness office. And so whenever, because the program has to go through them and they have to update and make any changes, accreditation curriculum or anything like that, we have got, um, based upon our collaboration, we now get those automatic notifications. And so they have plugged us in to those. Great. Um, and then uh, Yolanda asks, and Yolanda, you may have to help me clarify here. Um, how do you receive the notifications? Yolanda, are, are you saying for how does the student or how does the institution, how does UK um, understand their, um, receive the notifications? You wanna pop on for that? How does the institution receive it? Gotcha, thank you. So how do you receive the notifications about Go ahead, Yolanda, why don't you clarify your question, please? I was back basically piggybacking on that you received the notifications and I was wondering how do you receive the, autom the automation? Does it come through email? Do you receive a pop-up? Um, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, a, it's an email notification uh, that actually a, a, a group uh, anyone who's connected with program development, which um, they've included us in that group, uh, everyone will get that email anytime a program uh, submits um, a notification that it wants to begin enrolling oh, students. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Yolanda. Um, our next question is about Lexis Advance and using that and uh, and, and what our colleague is asking is, does Lexis Advance provide all the information you need? Um, the regulation uh, versus the statute versus unwritten rules uh, to determine the educational requirements for licensure. Uh, he's wondering, is it written in a way that a non-subject matter expert can interpret? And um, does it keep track when changes occur? So, Lexis Nexus or Lexis Advance is actually a tool for lawyers and other legal professionals. So it is going to be written in a way that is more legal jargon, like the actual law and regulation itself. 
However, it's very detailed. You can actually go to the bottom, say of a regulation, and you can track specific changes. You can track anything from as little as they removed the and replaced A. And so that helps a lot because when you have to do your annual updates, you can kind of just go to the bottom instead of, if you keep track of the specific regulations that you need to go back and look at, you can just go to the bottom and see have any updates been made since you uh, put out that information. Um, so that saves a lot of time, but it does have everything that you need. It does have all those specific details. And then also, if you wanna get into the weeds, um, a lot of times you can see like examples of how, for example, an, an interpretation of regulation is based upon a case or a specific example, because they'll include notes and cases and sometimes as well. Great. Um, do you also have the US territories in your map? So we have um, the, uh, the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico in our map. Um, we don't have um, the, the other territories, um, but we do have a statement that if students want to know something uh, about those territories, we just have so few students um, and so few questions, but um, we have, we direct students to ask us directly. Um, and also because we're, we're gonna need to do that research. We do have DC as well. Yes, DC as well. Great. Okay. Um, another colleague asked about how you found the regulatory information regarding the different international countries. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes, that was fun. Um, <laughs> Christina, Christina can appreciate. Um, so a lot of uh, the ministries do have regulations in English. Um, Typically, the, it will be the Ministry of Education or a similar, um, a similar site. There is a really good resource. Um, I will type it into the chat because it's a little bit, um, if I say it out loud, you won't. It's, it's enicnaric. So it is actually the um, quality, I'll say quality assurance, accreditation, it's an international database that tracks um, all of the different ministries that are in charge of either quality assurance, accreditation, or recognition of uh, professional uh, degrees from other countries. So it's a very great resource. They have a map and you can select all, any country and it will give you the ministries that are relevant for that country. Um, another really good resource are the Education USA offices. Um, typically, if there are no regulations in English, they are a really great resource. One, because they know the language. Two, they are also familiar with distance learning regulations. Um, and if they don't know the answer, they know who in the ministry would know the answer. And so they're a really great uh, source of information if you're looking for a specific country. Um, and I will let Christina share any that she has found because we kind of split the countries and went at it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think Emily has pretty much covered everything. I mean, there are some um, regulations within Lexis as well, but um, depending on the subscription you have, um, those may not be as detailed or they may be lesser. Um, so you will have to definitely rely on those ministries of education and all those international contacts um, to be able to sometimes put those, uh, fill those gaps and put those pieces together. Uh, along with that, so I, I, that's great that you have found the regulations in regard to education specifically. I know some of the communication that we've had with um, uh, two different law firms that have, have done research with attorneys in those countries. Um, have also shared about digital services taxes, as well as um, privacy uh, laws in the various countries. Uh, how did you all, you know, manage and, and work on um, work on that? Oh, look, you're able to go right sure. to it. That's great. So I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and there's also, 
<laughs> and we also have um, some of those disclosures at the top of our international uh, distance learning database. We talk about um, some of those considerations um, regardless of a student being able to take classes from another country, you will want to consider those degree recognition considerations, mm -hmm. technological considerations, um, you know, depending on the, the country's laws. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is a really, this um, uh, EY resource is, I put it also the link in the chat, um, is one of the best resources if you're looking for just, um, kind of first step information about digital taxes. They will, they do a really good job every year of saying what countries have new taxes. Um, so, you know, for example, Mexico has their new digital tax. And so they've included that in this version, but they also have the contact of the relevant minist tax ministry for that country um, and other contacts that are within EY that are advisors. So a very good first resource that I came across. Great. Thank you for putting that in the chat. So it sounds like what you have done is a lot of preparation in order to be able to provide those opportunities for those students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I believe uh, one of our colleagues was asking about the other resources. Is this the American Education USA? Is there, do you have uh, a link for that? I do. <laughs> Of all of these, Look I like that. barely. I like barely have to type, and uh, <laughs> things pop up. You know, that's how it happens. <laughs> that's great. Yes, and they have almost every country in there. And I guess another thing that we should mention as well is that we typically um, would say, well, on all of our statuses, we say even if it's authorized or permitted, right? That no on the ground activity is permitted there. So even if it's required clinical for to graduate from a nursing program, we cannot do that on the ground in that location, um, except for a case by case basis. And then that would require us coordinating with our UK legal to see if that's a possibility that we can get that done. Um, and we stress to, to uh, programs that even if one student is permitted, right, doesn't mean that now all of your students are permitted um, because you've gotten that exception for that one student. Very good clarification. Thank you. I think another thing that you all um, indicated a couple of minutes ago about how important it is for the institutions to communicate with their own general counsel, um, as they may vary in their view of legal risk for the institution. So, of course, you want to have um, communication with your own general counsel about uh, your plans. Um, so I'm really glad that you mentioned that. Are there any other questions? I, I just feel this has been such a, a, an enriching hour. Um, I'm so glad that we recorded this. I think everyone will really benefit um, from review of this um, even after our session is over today. Any other questions? Well, there don't appear to be any questions. So I'm going to give my thanks, my very big thanks uh, to Emily Woods and to Christina Walker and to Miranda Hines. Um, the University of Kentucky has done a bang up job. Thank you so much. And thank you for this wonderful presentation. Um, I feel like our fall was very enriched uh, by uh, some wonderful institutions with the work that they're doing. We started in September with Ohio State University. We were uh, then with the University of um, Missouri, Kansas City in October and University of Michigan uh, was in November and then uh, following up are at the end of our series here with the University of Kentucky. All of these presentations are accessible on the SAN website um, so that you can review the trans, the, the PowerPoints are there that go along with each of those recordings um, and access to information. Uh, thank you all again. This has just been a wonderful um, presentation today and uh, very good work. Um, no other questions. I just want to thank you all for being here and I hope you all enjoy a wonderful holiday season and we look forward uh, to January and being back together again. Have a great day. Best of all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.